It's 9 a.m., time for the only Garden Talk radio show in Milwaukee. Tell your friends, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is on the air. Join us and let's grow together. Coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, it's about lessons that we have learned in the garden that we want to share with you so you don't make them, as well as plant-based energy boosters. We'll go over some several plants that you can take instead of using energy drinks to get that afternoon boost. Plus, author Paige Embray will be with us to talk about the honeybee. All that plus your garden questions, and that all starts right now. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Barrett, some of the realest gardeners that you'll ever know, always willing to share their knowledge, mistakes, and working to grow together. Founders of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com that contains over 1,100 garden videos to show and teach others to grow some of what they eat. Join them for the next hour as they cover practical gardening information that has worked for them and more. Now here they are. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Uh, so happy you've joined us on this Saturday morning. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, gardening partner. Holly Baird. There's a number of ways in which you can contact us during the program. Well, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is our destina- your destination for all the gardening content that you can possibly handle at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Uh, 1,200, 1,300 garden videos, short and long format podcast of every episode that we've done on the program here with in studio and podcast form and just go to your favorite podcast providing website and type in the wisconsin vegetable gardener and you'll find us and all the content that uh, you may have missed you can reach us by a number of fashions here one is the ivy organics three in one plant guard hotline the ivy organic three in one plant guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn Insects and rodents protects newly installed plants and trees, shields prune and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. You can visit ivyorganics.com. For more information, you can call us anytime with your question or comment during the show at 414-444-5250, 414-444-5250. As well as you can uh, email us at twvgshow at gmail.com. Uh, you can also tweet us at our Twitter handle as a TWVG show or hashtag TWVG. Well, we're going to talk and get in the program here. We're going to talk about the mistakes in which we have made, the, or well, lessons that we have learned, not necessarily mistakes that we have made this year in the garden. Now, Holly and I were thinking about what is the lessons that we have learned this year, and we had a whole bunch of them. We thought, well, we already knew that. We already knew that. So we narrowed it down to ones that we actually did learn this year uh, compared to what we had already known prior and trying to avoid the mistakes making the, the, to learn the lessons. So, Okay, so the first one I think we should talk about is our potatoes. Um, it's kind of twofold. One is that we're kind of deciding if we're going to continue to grow potatoes. But we also had our potatoes, a lot of them, probably 75% of them, rot in the ground. And that wasn't the, the, the result of the potato itself or the variety of potato. It was because we got a, the, the plants died back during their normal cycle, and then they began to, we, we got a lot of water, a lot of rain. And the rain caused the potatoes to begin to rot in the ground. So we had that issue. Now, the problem that we have with potatoes, we are not the go-to potato farmers that you might find on the internet. Uh, the general rule of potato return on investment is for one pound of potatoes you put in, you should be getting between three to five pounds, let's say that, five on the high end of pounds return. For every one pound you plant, you should get five. Some of the better farmers from the better potato growers can get 10, and some can even get 15 uh, on extreme levels. You plant one pound of potatoes, you get 15 in return. Now, we have averaged between two to four pounds. Sometimes, I think one year we had six pounds on return on investment. Uh, Mm -hmm. But for what you can buy at the store, a 10-pound bag for three or four dollars, now the organic is a little higher. Yeah, even organic is pretty pretty reasonable in price at this point. So I don't know if it's um, just because potatoes are a demand of a product and there's a good supply of them. Or what? But I agree that because of that, we should maybe consider not growing potatoes. So let's do a little mathematician work here. So you have one potato plant. Let's say you put one pound of potatoes in. And we get in return on a good year, let's say, four pounds of return on potatoes. 
that is typically, oh, let's say a five or six foot row. Just pull, pulling numbers here. In a five, let's say an eight foot row. So in an eight foot row in tomatoes, you would plant four tomato plants, one every two foot off each one of those tomato plants. You can per- safely project to get between 15 and 20 pounds over a growing season, even on a bad year with a good variety like a black crim. It's a tremendous difference in return there. Uh, four plants at, say, 10 pounds, that's 40 pounds, versus one pound of potatoes at four pounds returns or five pounds returns. So, and the value, you know, you, we've got to look at if we lived in the country and we were 30 minutes from the local grocery store and we had five acres that we could plant on, we would plant potatoes again next year mm-hmm. because we could make it work. We could physically, we could, we could go, okay, it's, it's financially viable for us to plant potatoes rather than driving 30 minutes to buy potatoes. So if you're just growing a few potatoes, I mean, we, we will probably get a few potatoes in the ground, but we're not. It's, it is fun to grow them, though. I know that might not make sense, but it, it's fun to harvest them because it's like a potato treasure hunt. You don't know what is there. It's, you have fun, to search it's for fun to harvest when not when, when when they're not when, rotten. Yeah, that's right. right yeah. That was a little that was disappointing. But when they're not rotten, it's kind of fun. So it's worth growing, I think, just a few because of that, that harvesting aspect. So we learned that. Second thing we learned was uh, if you don't have good plant starts in the spring, don't try to put poor or small undersized plant starts in the ground. Just go and buy them from the local gar- buy them from Blue Mills, uh, or if you're outside of the Milwaukee area, uh, your local garden center, and get good healthy plant starts and put in the ground. The reason why, which we kind of knew this already, but we were trying to save and save and salvage what we had. For those of you who follow us on the video series side of the thing uh, on the website, we had a a soil company sponsor that uh, provided us that was you know we were using their product and it was not what was promised. The in, in information was not what was uh, was incorrect in what we were being told, and our plant starts suffered. Our leeks are. Our kale, our brassicas, our onions all died because of this mater- this planting uh, material. Uh, so we terminated the contract with them and reached out to Purple Cow, and, and Purple Cow was more than happy to come on uh, the show here and be a sponsor. But we uh, had to go buy our plant starts. Right. We had to buy our plant starts, and the ones that we did have um, were – not so not good. The, the ones that we started with, that right. old, that, that bad material, yeah, yeah, the bad uh, potting soil. So we went and bought plant starts, and we had phenomenal, we've got phenomenal kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. Uh, we had great kohlrabi from, from uh, when we bought them at Blue Mills, great onions. Uh, leeks look phenomenal. Uh, so don't try to plant, uh, well, we did try to, we did plant the, the ground cherries. They were teeny tiny things that. Uh, they were like three inches tall when they should have been about 10 inches tall. Those are still producing. Yeah, they're doing okay. Uh, but just imagine what the production would have been if we would have started with a healthy plant versus a you know a, a 10-inch plant versus a 2-inch plant. Same thing with the peppers and the eggplants. We started with one to 2-inch plants. And I think I think we also learned that we were very transparent about this yes. with, with our— You can go um, to the YouTube channel and type in the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, I'm sorry, and we put a video out and— because we think, were getting feedback from people who were buying the product that we recommended and saying, hey, this stuff's junk. It's killing our plants. And Right. And I think that we also learned that we, cause, because of the huge response we got in return from that, that we really appreciate our followers and our listeners. And we like to be transparent with them. And I think they appreciated that. Well, yeah. I'm not going to you know hide stuff and go, okay, well, we, we've got to do something else. And you know it makes us look bad in the long run. It always catches up to you. Uh, we learned that leaves, we, we kind of knew this, but it, it reinforced our uh, knowledge of the importance of leaves in the this garden. This is basically number three and four. Yes. Co- kind of combined, kind of not combined, whatever. Um, so leaves are very healthy for your soil. So what you want to do now, especially now because we're getting a lot of leaves falling off the trees, is you want to collect those leaves and put them on your garden. Just put them on the garden. You don't need to shred them. Just just get them on the garden right now. Even if you have weeds coming up or the plant life, you can remove the diseased plant life that you have and just dump the leaves on it. That's what we're going to do uh, for the next eight weeks is just collect leaves and just get them in the garden, not shred them, and mound them up two to three, two, two to three foot 
over our grow areas. And by, I guess it was early June, most of it had broke down and didn't even know we had anything in the garden. And we brought 2,000 pounds in. How do I know? I weighed several garbage barrels full and removed the weight of the garbage barrel and did the math and calculated how many things we brought in. He really did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To figure out how much we were putting in the garden. Uh, so leaves. Um, and the other thing, in the spring, we can leave the leaves there. They will have broke down, compressed somewhat. You can move the leaves back, plant your plant start, and then bring the living mulch or that mulch back around the plant to suppress weeds and hold water uh, the water retention uh, that the leaves provide so you don't have to buy hardware cloth or buy mulch of some sort or another uh, in order to do that. The other thing we were able, uh, is, uh, you know, the, just the amount of leaves and if, that broke down to feed the soil uh, was incredible and the healthiness of the worm population obviously yeah, so increased. Worms, uh, worms are very important for your garden. They won't overpopulate they themselves. They won't overpopulate yeah. themselves. However, you don't want to add worms. You want to add organic material, which will kind of invite the worms. Um, if you feed them, they will come, and then they're going to build their home there, and they won't, they won't make too many. Right. So, if you have non-toxic soil right. and, you have, and you add organic matter, give it a little time, the worms are going to find it. They migrate up from up beneath, and, and they start their home there and build a city and, and all of that and build factories and, and start working in your garden. Doing their thing. Doing their thing. Right, but that's important to know because leaves will – increase your worm population sometimes we pull the leaves back and the worms are just kind of at the surface it's called organic material uh, added to that and chemical free grass clippings uh, you can also shredded paper you can do that as well so along with that we put cardboard as mulch um where is that patch by the Yacon, where the Yacons, uh, Yacons, are, Yacons are, now. are yeah and that worked it worked well now, now first of all we, we you know there is a certain level of toxicity that can be uh, tied to the glue in which the cardboard is uh, combined with uh, we feel and we we've looked into this and we feel with the minute amount of toxicity we're already full of toxins anyway the little bit that that is uh, emitting into the soil uh, offsets the tremendous benefit that the cardboard provides for us in the in the realm of weed suppression, water retention, and aesthetics uh, when we plant our plants. We have the leaves are down, as we talked about in the fall. So in the spring, we come in and we layer the amount of cardboard that we have available. We remove the tape, uh, any tape on that, uh, we, and then we flatten it out and we cut holes and then plant our plants. So... I guess with this being said, this might be hard to visualize. By the time spring happens, those leaves have gone from, you know, seventy five percent, seventy five percent down. So you're, it's not like we're putting, we're, we're putting cardboard on like two feet of leaves. Right. They've really broken down, so it's maybe about a half inch. Well, six inches. Six inches. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but like Joey said, we do. It, they do break down, so it's not like. I guess that's kind of funny to think about if, if uh, a big a big a rainbow hoop of, of cardboard over leaves. Yeah. Right. But we, we are still working with that. And it worked well where we did implement this particular procedure. The only place where the weeds were coming up was the cracks in which the cardboard was not overlayered and where the hole uh, is at for the plant to grow through. The weeds were coming up through that particular uh, area that the sunlight exposed to the soil. And we want to cover the soil. The suffer- and we've had guests on the program, and we've talked about it. Leaving soil exposed is like going outside on a hot summer day without a shirt on. You're going to get sunburn. The sun is going to, to hurt your body. Same thing with the soil. It's going to – the wind, the snow, the rain, it erodes and removes material and microorganism and, and particles of the soil in which you need to, to keep covered and lock in to, to, instead of being flushed away. Right. So that um, is important is the leaves and then how the cardboard is placed on there. And the reason why we kind of are concerned also about covering the soil is if you look anywhere in nature, aside from like a desert, there's no bare ground. So if you're out, you know, hiking in the woods or whatever, there's always some sort of ground cover. And that makes for a very nice uh, growing situation. So some of the mistakes that we have made that we hope that you don't make because of we did it for you. So when we come back, we're going to go over a number of plant-based energy boosters. Instead of having to buy the expensive bottle of energy drink at the grocery store, we're going to go over what you can buy that is more natural right after this. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show.
24-7-365. TheWisconsinVegetableGardener.com has all the gardening information you need. Videos, digital magazines, replays of shows, and more. An Oya is an unglazed porous clay pot with a short neck and a wider belly. Bury your Oya neck deep in your raised bed, container, or ground garden and let the Oya do your watering by releasing water as needed. How? By soil moisture tension for all you techies out there. This is an eco-friendly, efficient, ancient way to water your plants using up to 70% less water than other irrigation methods. It saves you time and is easy to install. Find a retailer through DrippingSpringsOyas.com. Smart watering, easy gardening. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh juice, carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cards, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Caterina Villa, open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 278 and online at beansandbarley.com. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from Plant Success Organics.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponic root cutting, seed sprouting, cocoa core, and soil. Plant Success Organics.com carries powder, granule, and tablet form of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil to give your plant the optimal opportunity to produce incredible harvests. For more information and to purchase, visit Plant Success Organics. The Gardener's Hollow Leg, the debris and harvesting bag you wear, comes with its own belt attachment, perfect for doing light pruning, weeding, harvesting on the ground or on a ladder, and many other uses. Find out more at thegardenershollowleg.com. Save 10% by using the word veggies at checkout. Zaz Products, offering great quality supplements that can help personal health and increase longevity. Committed to bringing you the highest quality products at the lowest price. Find out more at zazproducts.com. Tall Earth Wood Treatment All-in-One Preservative and Stain offers lifetime protection and creates a unique silver-aged wood finish. All ingredients are non-toxic, eco-friendly, perfect for garden beds and veg trunk. Find out more at TallEarth.com. Free shipping on all orders. Use coupon code W-I-S-C-O-N-V-E-G to save 15% off orders placed at TallEarth.com. Apple cider, apple juice. Apple cider is made from apples that have been pressed from raw juice, and it is not shelf-stable. It will ferment over time and become alcoholic. Apple juice is always pasteurized, so fermentation is not a problem, and the juice is shelf-stable and available year-round in your non-refrigerated grocery store aisle. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Flame Engineering, Eco Garden Systems, Bob X, Plant Success, Beans and Barley, MI Gardener, Outpost Natural Food Co-op, Root Assassin, Manure Tea, The Gardener's Hollow Lead. Find all sponsors at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. It's, it's uh, no wonder that energy drinks are very popular. As Americans and humans, we do sometimes don't get enough sleep, enough rest, busy people, go, go, go. There's a lot of things in energy drinks that are possibly good for you, and there's stuff that's possibly not so good for you. One is uh, caffeine. Not I drink coffee every morning, so I'm not knocking caffeine. But then there's things like... Um, guarna, which is basically another form of caffeine. It does the same thing to your body that caffeine does. Uh, there's a lot of sugar in energy drinks, typically. And then taurine, um, basically, it does support brain development, and it does regulate your body body's mineral and water levels. So there's some positive things there. And then there's obviously caffeine in energy drinks, uh, ginseng. Which ginseng is a... 
natural. It's a plant that grows, and uh, Wisconsin's one of the. Uh, but that's the cold ginseng, right? Right. Well, I'm explaining ginseng is uh, Wisconsin's one of the main producers of ginsengs in the world. It's a root crop that there's two different. There's a hot ginseng and there's a cold ginseng. And the Asian community uh, actually understands the premise of how all of that works in with the body. And energy drink companies have figured out that they can include that. And actually, uh, it's a benefit to the uh, overall structure of that energy drink. Now, not you know, with any of these energy drinks, you want to follow the recommended rate of consumption. I think the biggest concern for a lot of people is that it's like the overconsumption. Because think... A little is good, a lot will keep me awake more. (laughs) Um, And ginseng can be problematic if you have too much. I don't think there... I think... The thing is, is the FDA doesn't exactly regulate all of these these natural things. So it's kind of like drink at your own risk. And they're not cheap to purchase either. What are we talking? Three, four, sometimes five, six dollars a can and some... Based on what we're purchasing right. some of the big named energy drinks. So with that being said, um, if you need a little boost, there's a few, there's a lot. If you just look up online natural plant-based energy boosters, it's going to, I think I found a list, a really good list of 27. So we're going to break down about five of them here for you. And a lot of these you can buy pretty cheaply at your local uh, Beans of Barley, Woodman's, Outpost, what have you. So or actually all these you can. Yeah. Um, so the first one is bananas and the good thing about bananas is that it gives you a boost of um, good carbs potassium and uh, vitamin b6 yeah so uh it's easy and and it's it's they're they're like a quarter a piece really and if you get them and here's the thing with bananas sometimes it's a quarter a pound a quarter pound here's the thing with bananas people think that a a brown banana is a rotten banana a green banana or a slightly yellow banana is a ripe banana. Totally backwards on this. The browner the banana, the riper it actually is. The green bananas and the yellow bananas are, are technically unripe fruit. Um, and, and people were like, oh, I don't want to eat a, a brown banana. Yeah, it's it's not as firm like we're traditionally taught to eat. But that mm-hmm. is – and supposedly the browner it is, the more antioxidants. Is that the – Right. So anything in, anything in nature – and actually I was just talking to a friend about this. Anything that consists in nature that is darker um, in color, so that would be like blueberries, acai berries, goji berries, um, cherries – Dark chocolate, coffee, all that stuff has more antioxidants in it. So that means that it's um, definitely it's going to be more beneficial to you in that sense. Um, quick, if you don't know what antioxidants is, oxygen is basically what kills us. Antioxidants help fight off those free radicals, and they're just healthier for you. All right. So apples, uh, bananas are not so much really, so so much so quickly grown or so easily grown here in Wisconsin, and that's just like the pineapple conversation I had a couple of weeks ago. We these uh, bananas are grown thousands and thousands of miles away. They're brought to Milwaukee or wherever you're at, and they're sold for a quarter a piece or a quarter a pound. Nobody's making money off this thing at all. Right. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're you're, you're growing ten million or so a billion. So apples also have a high antioxidant co- content. Um, they they are a little bit higher in natural sugars, which isn't necessarily a problem because you get that fiber from the skin of the apple, so it kind of slows down your body's digestive process of that. Now, this is for a medium size apple. Yeah, you don't really if you eat a ginormous apple, a softball size apple. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So this is like a tennis ball size apple. Okay. But what you could do um, if you eat an apple is eat some something with protein with it, some peanut butter or some cheese. And that'll help your help it, it digest the, better. The thing with the, all these vegetables and fruits, if you're not used to eating vegetable or fruits, you're gonna it, it's not gonna feel like you you're full. You're gonna eat it and you're like, I'm still hungry. I'm still hungry. I have a friend and she said eating apples is like eating air. I can eat three ice cream sandwiches and I'm full. I've got to eat apple after apple before I even feel full. Well, your body's not accustomed to the consumption of the healthy versus not ne- the, the ice cream sandwich is the not healthy aspect, and your body reacts differently to the, 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 the feeling of being full based on that type of item in which you're consuming. Right. Uh, so, yeah, apples are a good energy. Uh, now, you don't want to eat the seeds. The seeds are not good for you or your pets. Uh, you can take the cores and make uh, apple cider raw vinegar. We talked about that on the show a couple of weeks ago. Another one here, which is not something you can necessarily grow or it can be grown. There is a, a procedure in which the product has to be made. It's dark chocolate. Yeah. So dark chocolate, I um, 
The reason so this, dark this excites a lot of you. Right. Um, there's many reasons to eat chocolate and dark chocolate. And one of them is because it does give you, um, it's got antioxidants in it. It can increase your blood flow and it can help deliver oxygen to your brain. In moderation. In moderation. Okay. Right. Yeah. You probably shouldn't eat like a pound of dark chocolate at your desk in the afternoon, yeah. but a few oh, pieces. birthday cake. Yeah. <laughs> it's typically not made with dark chocolate, yeah. but, um, yeah. Yeah, so a few pieces, whatever, whatever is, you know, whatever you want. But um, it also has this stimulatory compound. It's called theobramine, and and then it does have some caffeine in it as well. Mm. So if um, if you're feeling like, you know, you want something kind of sweet and you want a little boost, dark chocolate. So dark is where chocolate, it's just not regular chocolate candy bar. Dark chocolate is is the key term here, in which has that energy uh, boost. Uh, properties. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, let's talk about another one: sweet potatoes. Uh, I, I when I, I I think of sweet potato pie. Okay, well that's not what you should think of, right? And I'm talking about the raw ingredient sweet potato. And I think this is this would be like a good lunch item for some sort of sustained energy. I don't think anybody's snacking on sweet potatoes, um, but sweet potato French fries does not fall underneath this category of energy boost. <laughs> right, they are good, but um, they, it doesn't. It, it takes away some of the uh, properties here. Yeah, so they it has uh, a lot of fiber, good fiber in it, um, and then it has it's a darker color, mm-hmm. so it has antioxidant, and then it has twenty eight percent of your recommended daily allowance of mag- magne- magnes and vitamin A. So those are um, natural minerals, vitamins that are good for you for your energy, and they do help. They do help break down your. Um, you're, they break down slower in your body versus a regular A potato. slower digestion yeah, rate yep. uh, in order to sustain that energy over a longer period of time, rather just a big boom boost, and that's it. Uh, let's talk about the next one and the final one that we have on our list today, which is legumes. Now, what is a legume? First of all, well, this is legumes, not just you know a, a common term, possibly. Legumes are good. They're basically a bean. So like the most common legume, I think there's beans fall under that one, but... Lentils and lentils are really. Is it a grain or is it a bean? It's a bean. Okay. It's a, it's a part of the legume family. It's also known as a a pulse something. It's like a, some acronym, whatever. Anyway, so they it has a lot of fiber. It also has some protein, and because of that high fiber, even though it does have carbs, again, it's because you have that high fiber. It slows down, or it doesn't. Digest as fast. It as delays and slower slowers the digestion uh, process, so it stays in your body longer. It's able to your internal intestinal process is able to extract the properties or the the nutrients out of it to give you the energy that you require on a longer instead of just a one shot boom. It prolongs that uh, energy um, nutrient value for a, a longer period of time. Right, and then it also has folate. Folate is really good for you. Um, it's, it's just one of those, you can do further research on this, but it's one of those things that is excellent for you. Uh, magnes and then zinc and iron. So all of those minerals are definitely something you want to. And, and we're all deficient in, in a variety mm-hmm. of different uh, minerals in our body, uh, that we are not. You know. But I would just say the biggest thing is to eat the rainbow. Um, so you want to eat a variety of foods. Not the cereal, the, the, the Lucky Charms, the, oh. yeah, yeah, no, the variety, the rainbow colors of vegetables. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you want to eat a cr- different varieties. You want to eat, if you're going to eat grains, eat whole grains because whole grains well, are. What, what would be the option if you didn't eat whole grains? What is the other, is it like a processed grain? Is that what we're? Yeah, like uh, like super processed white bread versus okay. like something that's a whole grain. That's got the grains in and mm-hmm. embedded in the, Okay. Right. So whole grains um, and then different variety of proteins, whatever you choose, just kind of keep it into more of the whole food versus a processed food. So there you go. You don't have to buy the expensive energy drinks. You can just buy some vegetables uh, in order to uh, get your energy afternoon boost or whenever you're uh, needing it, and especially the dark chocolate. Well, when we come back, Paige Embre will be with us. She is an author, and we're going to talk about the honeybee and uh, learn some things that we were not uh, familiar with uh, right after this. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show.
got a question, email the show at twbgshow at gmail.com. Are you short on time when it comes to grocery shopping? Yes, I'm talking to you. Shopwoodmans.com offers online shopping for store pickup or delivery on their over 60,000 plus items at Woodman's Everyday Low Prices. Or online, select a pickup or delivery time and create more time to do what you want. Leave the work to Woodman's. Also, check out the shopwoodmans.com app. You can even make specialist requests like specific sizes of produce. For more information, visit shopwoodmans.com. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. Now with over 450 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom, and organic flower, vegetable, and herb seeds available year-round. Pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and garden needs, tools, and special blend fertilizers. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. BobX is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. BobX deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. BobX can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more? Visit BobX.com. B O B B. BEX.COM. Shield and Seal Vacuum Sealers and the highest quality vacuum sealing products, unique black and clear and all black bags, protecting your produce and product better than traditional bags. Find out more at shieldandseal.com. Rebel Green, responsibly made natural products that are good for you and the environment. Made in the USA, plant-based, vegan, and always toxic-free. Find out more at rebelgreen.com. Use coupon code WIVEG15 to save 15% off your next purchase at rebelgreen.com forward slash shop. Root Assassin, a garden tool that does all the root functions with its advanced shovel that has serrated edges on both sides. Find out more information at rootassassinshovel.com. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is brought to you by the following. Handy Safety Knife, BioSafe, Tall Earth, Chapin International, The Plant Booster, IV Organics, Woodman's Market, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Well, Holly, the uh, fall is here. It was a hard frost on the pumpkin this morning here in the Milwaukee area. I don't know if it was at the other garden, but the house garden uh, things don't look too good. But Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center, I was over there this past week, talked to uh, several of the staff members and John. They're going to be open until the snow flies with their bulk material. Now, they do have some fall mums. They have some fall Swiss chard and a few pumpkins, but the majority of it is uh, their bulk material. They're going to keep the doors open. The coffee shop's open the year-round. Uh, they got 40 varieties of bulk material, so now's the time to uh, start looking at, you know, what, what, what can be done here. Mulch, uh, rock, gravel, compost, cut purple cow, variety of formulas. Uh, give them a call. Uh, where, 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 what number can we call to talk to Blue Mouse, first of all, and where are they located? They are at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield, just south of Layton. You can call 414-282-4220 or go to bluemouse.com. But, yeah, definitely, uh, they'll, like you said, they'll be up right until the snow starts to fall. Yeah, and, and possibly a little later uh, based on what they have left. So uh, they also do uh, free landscape consultation. So if you're looking at doing something possibly in the spring, get them out now. And they can uh, see what you what 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 you want to do. They're going to listen to you and kind of give you an estimate, and you can see if they uh, need to come out in the spring. Well, Holly, let's go to the IV Organics uh, Three in One Plant Guard Hotline and bring in our next guest. Paige Embry is an author with a passion for gardening, living in Seattle, Washington. She's taught classes on geology, soils, gardening, and pruning. She's very knowledgeable on bees and bee science. Welcome to the program, Paige. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join Holly and myself and not over, not, not only educate us, but educate our listeners as well. Oh, you're welcome. So let's start with a simple question here, and, and, and it may be elementary level for Holly and me, but there are people that are out there that are listening that may not understand why bees 
are so important to us humans? Can we can we can you kind of go over the the this this short answer on why are bees so important and, and why should we be concerned with when we hear about hive die off and, and loss of bee population? Well, there are the the main thing that they do for us is that they pollinate plants. And there are Oh, probably around 200,000 different kinds of animals that pollinate plants, but the queens are the bees of pollination because female bees actually, most female bees actually go to a plant to collect pollen. So they're, they're going to um, always come into contact with it, whereas a lot of other animals and insects just go to get the, the nectar and they may or may not come into contact with it. So they are primo pollinators. And I don't have the statistics in front of me, but like one bee has to travel hundreds of thousands of miles or something to, in order to create one pound of honey or some astronomical number in the number of flowers they have to um, be in contact with? You know, I don't know the number for how far they have to travel. Honeybees can travel um, more than a mile if they need to to go to flowers, but of course they like it better when there's flowers close to home. But honeybees are only one kind of bee, and there's 20,000 different species in the world. And so some of them are really small, and they don't travel very far, and they don't make honey. So it, it, it's going to vary from bee to bee. And you're right. And, and are, are all bees pollinators? You said not all of them make honey, but do all of them pollinate, or are there different categories in which bees fall under some ca- uh, pollinators, some not? No, all bees are pollinators. Some are going to be better pollinators than others are. Um, There is the male bees don't actually collect pollen. It's only the female bees that um, collect pollen because they use it to feed their babies. And so female bees tend to be better than other bees. And, And in that group, there's going to be some that are more efficient than others. So some bees are better pollinators, but all bees are going to flowers to collect nectar and so just to eat themselves. And so that makes them pollinators. What what is the general life cycle of a bee? Uh, how how many years or months do it does a typical bee live? Um, so most bees are not like honeybees. Uh, they don't live in hives. They don't have a bunch that are living and working together. Most are solitary bees. So for most bees, what happens is the mother lays an egg in a hole somewhere, either below ground or above ground, and the egg goes through. It, it, it turns into a larva, so it looks like a little grub, um, and then it pupates, and then it becomes an adult. So it goes through complete metamorphosis, sort of like what you think of for a butterfly. But most of their life is lived in that little hole somewhere, um, and then they come out usually about a year after they're laid. This isn't for honeybees. It's for most of the other bees. About a year after they're laid, and then they live for about a month or so most of them, as adults out flying around and pollinating. So their time pollinating is actually short a short period of time. Now you say not all bees live in hives, so what other homes do bees find in order to con- carry on their lives? Well, most bees live in, in the ground. About 70% of the bee species live in the ground. And they, a lot of them will dig their own little holes. So they have, a lot of times you'll see just like a flat hole in the ground, or it might look like a little ant hole. Um, some bees also live in uh, pre-made holes above ground, so like old beetle burrows and, and dead wood and things like that. So that will account for a lot of the bees. And then there's, there are some social, other social bees like bumblebees, where you've got a bunch of bees living together, so they need a bigger hole. So, like, bumblebees often find uh, pre-existing holes in the ground, like old rodent holes, and make their nests there. Okay. Now, we hear about neonicotoids and bee deaths. Um, First of all, what are neonicotoids, and what is the correlation? So, neonicotinoids is a kind of insecticide. And so the purpose of insecticides is to kill insects, and bees are insects, as are a lot of the things that we don't like on our plants um, that may come along and sort of eat the leaves and things like that. And so the thing about, I'm just going to call them neonics because it's quicker and easier, the thing about them that makes them sort of 
special is that the, a lot of pesticides get sprayed on the outside of a plant, but for neonics, they get taken up by the roots and transported throughout the plant so you can find the pesticide everywhere in the plant, and there's not, you don't have to use very much of it. So that makes them sort of special as a pesticide, and they're often used as a treatment around seeds, and so the seed just comes to you with the pesticide available to it. Well, and that's the other thing. We encourage people, and people think dandelions are the evil of all evils in a yard. We encourage people not to spray the dandelions because nature has designed a dandelion to be one of the first uh, polyp pollinatable flowers in the spring. So we spray it with a toxicity uh, that has nicanoids in it, and then the bee takes it back and basically infests the whole colony with that toxin. Well, it, it, there has been a study that you know, looked at um, honey around the world for honeybees and found that um, neonics and actually probably a number of other insecticides have been found in that honey. So we do know that it is getting back to the honey, and it is trans when it's transported throughout the plant, it does end up in the uh, nectar and the pollen. And one of the things most people don't realize is that you can do a study on honeybees and find one thing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's true for all of those other 20,000 species of bees out there. So even if you find something is maybe not that bad for honeybees, it may be better or worse for some of those other bees, and, and mostly there's not going to be studies done on those other bees. So the safest thing is always to not use insecticides and definitely not to do something like with the, the neonics where you're just assuming there's going to be a problem because you're putting that pesticide on the seed. And so you're treating for a problem that doesn't even necessarily, might not even come to exist. Exactly. Now, we'll talk about honeybees because most people are familiar with that species. Are honeybees native to North America or were they brought in by a, a, a culture of people? Well, they are not native to North America. They came in to North America with the early colonists because they brought them over not as pollinators, but for their honey and their beeswax. I'll be. That's definitely interesting. Um, what can we do as backyard gardeners or even um, maybe we just want to plant a few things? What, what can we do to increase bee population? Uh, so one of the things you can do is, again, there are lots of different kinds of bees that come out at different kinds of the year. So it's good to have flowers throughout the year starting early because some of those bumblebee queens wake up early and they're starving after sleeping through the winter and so having some really early blooming plants wherever you are can be helpful crocuses for example are, are a nice um, pollinator plant and to make sure that you've got it's a lot easier for bees if you plant in big clumps of one kind of flower because they're, they're, they, they focus on that color, uh, is that what attracts them to that colony of flowers? Is that what we're uh, recommending to plant in groups? Uh, I'm recommending to plant in groups because bees have to learn how to get the pollen and nectar out of a flower, especially some of the complicated flowers like snapdragons and things like that. Um, and so once they learn, it's easier for them to just collect from the same kind of flower and, it, and if they're long-blooming flowers, that's even better because then they can go back to that same patch day after day after day, and they know how to get the food. It's like going to a grocery store where you know, you know, that's familiar to you. You know where to go, and it's a, lot, a much more quick and efficient for you. Well, uh, we, we talk about the honeybee, and also in the garden community, we hear the term carpenter bee. What is a carpenter bee uh, for those of us who may not be familiar with or that like term? like a mason bee. A mason bee, bee yeah. Uh, a mason bee is a group of bees that's a solitary bee. So each, each bee lives their entire life alone. Nobody help, helps it collect pollen and nectar for its, for its babes. Um, and it lives in an, a, most of them live in above ground holes. And you can actually put out like blocks of wood that have been drilled and they will often make holes in it. But one of the things that makes them cool is that many of them are early 
spring bees, and so they're really and they are really efficient at pollinating like apples and cherries and things like that. But they need mud because between each egg they put up a little mud wall, a little mud wall, and that's why they're called basin bees because they they use mud to make their homes. I mean, now you've got a new book out all about bees. Tell us a little bit about the book and where can we get it. Uh, the book is called Our Native Bees, North America's Endangered Pollinators and the Fight to Save Them, and it can be gotten at bookstores or online. It seems to be readily available in a lot of places. And in the book, it's not a how to garden for bees uh, kind of book, although there's a fair amount of that kind of thing in there. It was, I learned that honeybees can't pollinate tomatoes, and it got me fascinated with all of the other bees that can pollinate tomatoes. And so I went and gathered up stories about bees and put them put them together in a book along with a lot of pictures because a lot of bees look nothing like honeybees and they're really cool. So there's a lot of photos in the book as well. So so it's kind of is it would it be able to identify certain species of bees that we may not be familiar with? Does it have that kind of uh, availability to it? You know, identifying new kinds of bees is hard. So there's lots of photos, so it's helpful. But the purpose is not to sort of teach you how to um, identify new bees. A great book for that kind of thing, it's not one you would just sit down and read in your armchair, which is what my book is, but a book if you want to learn, like, start to learn how to identify bees. A great one is called Bees in Your Backyard. Okay. Well, I greatly appreciate the, the time that you've given us uh, on the program. Uh, again, your book is probably available, what, on Amazon as well? Absolutely. Okay. And um, do you have a website or anything like that? I do. My website is just my name, www.pageembry.com, and you can find uh, links on there and some blog posts. So you can go there and get to the book or see some of the other um interviews and things like that I've done as well. Well, Paige, we greatly appreciate you taking time not only to educate Holly and myself, but all of our listeners, too. Well, thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. And when we come back, your garden questions and our garden answers, you're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. If you have a gardening question, now is the time to call in on the IVorganics.com 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline at 414-444-5250. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants, to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Hostels wants to help you grow your own food. From seed starting supplies, hand tools, drip irrigation, harvesting equipment, and a complete line of all-natural pest control solutions, they've got you covered. Keep your garden weed-free with their time-tested, American-made wheel hose that are built to last a lifetime. And the Precision Garden Seeders have proven design for planting a wide variety of seeds. Haas Tools has what you need to get the most out of your growing space, large or small. Free shipping and outstanding customer service. Shop online or request a free catalog at HaasTools.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy, homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar, honey, or any alternative sweetener you'd like. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Available at most natural food stores and online. Purple Cow Organics quickly and naturally increases the uptake of nutrients and water to your plants with their new bioactive vegetable supercharger designed to meet the unique needs by helping the living organisms in the soil help plants uptake the nutrients more quickly through their roots and leaves. Find out more at purplecoworganics.com. Flame Engineering, home of the weed dragon, the perfect propane torch kit for home and garden use. For killing weeds, no need to pull or spray. 100 other uses. Find out more at flameengineering.com. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. 
We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Haas Tools, Tree Dike, Root Maker, Seating Square, Rebel Green, Dripping Springs Oya, Zaz Products, Shield and Seal, Pomona Universal Pectin. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. You just don't want to lollygag around and take your sweet time. You, you, this is a time-sensitive thing. With your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Ivy Organic 3-in-1 Plant Garden actually protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields prune and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. You can find more information at ivyorganics.com. You can call on any time with your question at 414-444-5250. We had a couple questions come in over social media, like always. and uh, Email address twvgshow at gmail.com. Twitter handle at twvgshow. And hashtag twvgshow on Twitter. And you can always find us on all of our social media platforms by just searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, and our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. Uh, I want to plant a pear tree in our new front yard, but I want to plant a pear tree um, uh, successfully. What is a good variety or varieties in which I can grow in Zone 5, and when should I plant the trees? Sure. So um, you can plant uh, one variety is called the uh, Harrow Delight, or the Warren. Um, otherwise, if you are at the, say, you're like, well, I don't know what the nursery has or whatever, you just go there, and typically your nursery is going to stock, if they're knowledgeable, they're going to stock what is needed. Right, they're for, not going to have a pear tree that can only grow in Connecticut uh, in, in Minnesota type of thing. Right, uh, so that that's one thing is like, hey, what should I get? Definitely I would check out your local garden center or nursery, what have you. Um, but you want to plant that tree in early spring or late winter, so kind of like that March-ish area. At least time. for the Zone 5 area mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. Also, you want to make sure that the specific type of variety of tree in which you're purchasing is, if you're looking for one tree, it's a self-pollinating tree. Otherwise, you would have to get two trees to pollinate uh, those uh, pollinate the two. Uh, some species and varieties are self-pollinating. Others need a partner in which to pollinate the fruit that, that they're growing. Uh, next question comes in. Uh, my carrots, beets, turnips are all are really late. I really got a late start on them. Two weeks ago, I looked at them, and the carrots were about one, uh, two inches in length, and the beets are about one inch across. My question is, should I pull them out, or can I leave them in and let them grow longer uh, with the potential frost and possible freeze here in the next days and weeks? I live about 30 minutes south of Green Bay, Wisconsin, Zone 5A. Thank you. Well, uh, fortunately, those are all cool, cooler weather crops. And if you're just going to have a frost like we had in the Milwaukee area last night, you're okay. It's not going to hurt them. It may slow their growth down a little bit, and then during the warmth of the day, it'll pick back up. But it's not going to kill them like it would a tomato, a pepper, or eggplant, that type of thing. The other thing in which you can do is if it's go- they, they can withstand a freeze up to about 27 degrees. So beyond that, what you can do is take your leaves and mound over that area mm-hmm. and basically create a blanket of, of insulation over top of your plants. If you're going to get like, like, for example, if tomorrow night's going to be 21 degrees, you can cover those with leaves, two, three foot of leaves. And then if the next week is going to be, you know, warmer temperatures and mild nights, you can remove the leaves. You're basically creating a little refrigerator to keeping the soil from freezing and keeping the plant from freezing. Now, you can also do this 
overwinter. You can overwinter them too. Amish has been known to do this with their carrots, especially they just create this humongous mountain of leaves over top of the bed in which they're preserving. And then they just go out, harvest what they want, cover it back up. So it's a living refrigerator outside. Right, definitely. And you um, can do this with your – it's a little bit more difficult with your Brussels sprouts and kale because of the size of the plant. But with beets, turnips, and uh, carrots, for example, those are easy to go about doing it. I also had um, a coworker ask me when, when to plant garlic, and I told her that we're planting garlic this weekend. You basically have uh, this week, next week, maybe the week after. Well, you can go until you can't chisel right, so you it in can't, the ground. Right. Yeah. And I, I kind of explained that to her as well. So that was uh, another question. She came to our garlic talk at the Germantown Library, and she said, we were informative and knowledgeable, and she really enjoyed it. Right. Well, that's good. Um, another uh, Back to the, the question about the carrots, beets, and turnips. Oh, yeah. uh, when would you recommend harvesting them? If you're not going to cover them, harvest them before the, fro- or before the ground freezes. And then that way, you know, if it freezes, you're, it, the plant's pretty much gonna, not going to be edible. At that point, uh, you want to harvest it prior to that. Leeks are one. Brussels sprouts are another. Kale is another that can handle a lot hardier temperatures as the temperatures get colder. Um, and, and, you know, whenever we get down to, you know, 23, 18, 15, a lot of these plants are not going to. They're going to go into dormancy. Uh, they're not going to be edible. Some of them will come back the following year. But uh, we want to keep that in mind that uh, uh, not all of these uh, we want to, you know, cover or can cover. Uh, what do we do? We've got an abundance of kale this year, Holly. What What is the recommendation real quickly? Uh, what can you do with the kale to preserve it? You can blanch it and freeze it. Um, that's one way. So you just take it, you take it off the stems, you blanch it, which means you put it in boiling water for like a few seconds and then put it into ice bath and then you freeze it in portions. All right. Now, you don't always have to have a question. You can also respond to comments of questions in which we've asked our guests. Uh, Deb did this under the in-studio video of the interview with our guest a couple of weeks ago, Melissa Larkas, who is a sustainable agricultural specialist in the Austin, Texas area. When we asked her, can you visually see if soil is healthy? She gave her answer, and, and Deb voiced in with her comment, which is accurate and correct. Deb says... One indicator I used for good soil is having lots of worms. I had a load of dirt brought in. I thought it was cheaper than buying in sacks. I did not find a single worm. Slowly, I am modifying it for container uses, but what a disappointment. Weeds love it, grow in it too. Glad to see more people using less chemicals. Well, thank you, Deb, for your comment, and she's exactly right. You can tell if soil is healthy by the number of worms in which you have in that soil. Now, it doesn't break down if you have lead in the soil or other chemicals or or levels of MPK in which you have, but worms typically do not go in toxic soil or dead soil uh, in order you know, to, to live. They want to go in somewhere where it's fertile, it's got a lot of organic material in which they can feed off of, and that is a great indicator of that. Now, we have a tremendous amount of worms in our garden. We don't till. We do soil disturbance when necessary for weed removal, root removal, and harvesting. We have uh, the University of Wisconsin, I believe, and Madison says you need to have somewhere in the range of 9 to 12 worms per square cubic square foot of soil to can be considered healthy or good shape. A couple of years back, we have tested that theory in our garden, and we haven't done it recently. I know the increase in population has is, is exploded, but we had 24 worms in one cubic square foot of soil, so that was twice as many as was recommended. Now, the nice thing about worms is they won't overpopulate themselves. Once they get to a, a population, it's very unique with worms and nature, uh, with the worms in the, in the garden or in a worm bin. Once they get to a population, populate for the instance of, you know, killing themselves out by eating a very unique way in which the worms utilize a, a, a location in the soil or a worm bin. Now, you should never add worms to a container or your garden. Worms can migrate into containers, grow bags based on the compost or soil you're putting in it. Sometimes they do contain worm uh, worm eggs, and they will 
uh, germinate that w- or uh, uh, develop that way. And if you add worms into your garden, you're bringing worms from an ecosystem that is not – they're not used to uh, putting them in an ecosystem they're not used to, and you can possibly uh, have – a overpopulation of one worm versus what's native to your area and you can cause problems or they will die off. So add organic material to your garden bed and they will come. You don't have to worry about it. We coffee grounds, shredded leaves, uh, compost, whatever the case is, natural, they will come and populate your garden and it will flourish. We are out of time, and we greatly appreciate your time joining us each Saturday morning on the program. If you want to revisit any of its podcast on the highlight tab on the main page of the website. You can also go to your favorite search engine or podcast provider and search the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, and you'll find podcast segments and shows there. Join us next week when we're going to talk about how to overwinter plants, what plants you can overwinter and which ones you can't. Uh, Some of them may be surprising to you, as well as how organic is the food that we're really eating, even when it's labeled organic. Plus, author Tova Martin will be with us to talk about her new book, plus your garden questions. So until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. You have been listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Tell a friend and join Joy and Holly again next week so we can all grow together. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com in association with WI Garden Media Broadcasting, live from the WNOV 860 AM and the W293CX 106.5 FM, Courier Communications Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin.